Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Can everybody uh, hear me while I decide talk about this? Um, okay. Yes. My, my talk will be about LDPs for Comcasts at intermediate uh, temperature, and uh, this was uh, part of a project that, that was supervised by something like that. I guess uh, or maybe by the mouse or the arrows. I didn't understand. Uh, okay, so the, the structure of this talk is as follows. Uh, first, uh, I, <clears throat> I will I in introduce the most important uh, background in this this field of plume gases. It has a lot to, to do with you know, the, the the work that Hardy uh, and staff have already presented. And it's also very related to the talk that the talk that Sylvia uh, will give. So I'll, I'll be very very brief with that. Also, and then I'll introduce the main results that prove, uh, and I'll give an overview of how I got that. Um, okay. Um, introduction. So uh, uh, cool gases are. A many particle system, which is, has been a very common theme throughout much of this workshop. So, of course, the starting point for the, the, the um, many particle systems is that I take some points that interact by two components. One is an uh, interaction uh, G, and uh, unlike, unlike the talk by Vera uh, Friska, I take the initial G. To be always repulsive, and more specifically, I actually take it to be the Coulomb interaction. So it satisfies that it's a partial and it's a direct out. And uh, okay, so if the potential, if the interaction is always repulsive, how do the particles not just fly out infinitely? Well, it's because they're, they're confined by an external potential V. And <clears throat> uh, we want to work in the most general setting uh, possible. So some people around the matrix of theory we tend to take the heat to be the, the potential x squared. Um, but we want to work with the potential dex as general as possible. So what we basically uh, want to impose a little hypothesis as possible. So basically what we actually need is that it grows fast enough at infinity uh, to actually contain the particles uh, the particles don't fly out. So starting point. Um, G is the, the, the Coulomb interaction, and the V is the general potential that grows fast enough at um, Okay, so we are interested in, oh, and uh, okay, so you notice that the, the sum of a VXI terms has a factor of N in front of what the other one does. Uh, it's because if I take the sum of particles, then uh, the first term is going to be a folder N squared. And the second term is just the, the sum of, of uh, the of x i is going to be a folder n. So I have to multiply that again by n. So I have a two terms for the n squared. So I, I actually observe a competition between the two. Um, okay, so I'm interested in the many particle limit. So of course, I have to look at the mean field uh, limit of that, that system. And the mean field uh, limit of the system is given by this question. Here, which I call EV, um, which is I mean, it's a very natural. We basically just uh, replace sums by integrals and uh, just the weights so that the thing has a uh, weight point. And now I think it's a classical theorem that, that this mean field limit has a unique minimizer and uh, that the, uh, the, the, the empirical measure. Of the minimizer of the original Hamiltonian converges to the, the, the minimizer of the mean field limit, which I call uh, mu v. Um, okay, so the, that um, most of the talk will be about um, the positive temperature uh, case. So I, it means a system in which uh, particles not only uh, interact via the Hamiltonian, but there is also some randomness. And in order to model that, 
it's necessary to introduce the, the free energy, which, <clears throat> which is the same as the mean field limit plus an added uh, entropy term. And then here, beta is the inverse temperature of the system. And the, the, the right scaling of free energy is take one over n beta as, as the weight of the energy. Right. So <clears throat> what happens in, in the function? Well, there are uh, two limits. One is temperature being very, very small, so beta being very, very big. And in that case, E beta converges to EV, which is, of course, what you expect at temperature zero, being the free energy that just is just an EV limit, and the thermal equilibrium measure, the minimizer, just is just the, the equilibrium measure. Um, the other limit is uh, when the temperature is um, very big, so beta very small, and, and in that case, the effect of the entropy becomes dominant. And, and then the, the, the thermal equilibrium measure has more and more mass spreading it out to infinity. And so in, in the limit, it's, well, it would converge to something that has mass everywhere except to something that has mass everywhere doesn't integrate to one. So it just spreads out to infinity. Um, another remark is that typically the, mean, the equilibrium measure may be as convex support, and I might get the thermal equilibrium measure uh, is positive variable, so it has support in all of our even if beta is uh, very small, no matter how small beta is. Um, okay, and throughout this talk, I will consider the case of uh, beta depending. So beta will be some power of n for the remainder of the talk. Um, okay. So like I said, this talk will be about uh, Coulomb gases at positive temperature. So you know that, that at zero temperature, the, the only point configuration that I uh, would look at is the, the configuration that, that minimizes the uh, So what happens? At positive temperature, well, at positive temperature, the, the position of the particles is not deterministic, it's a random variable. And the, the density of that random variable is given by the Gibbs measure. So this is, <clears throat> this is the Gibbs measure. And that you can see that its, its value is largest when the Hamiltonian is smallest, so it still concentrates around the minimizers of the Hamiltonian, but there is a non-zero probability of observing an configuration that's far from, from the, the minimizer of Hamilton. Um, in, in that equation, uh, C in beta is a partition function, so it's a normalizing constant in order to make the Gibbs measure a probability measure. And again, you can look at two uh, asymptotes of that. If the, if the temperature is very big, then beta becomes very small, and the, the Gibbs measure will give a roughly equal to probability to both point configurations. So it will be like a Poisson <clears throat> process. And the, the other limit is when the temperature is very small or beta is very big. And in that case, the Gibbs measure will convert to a direct delta around the, the minimizer of the capital. Um, and I, I realize that I'm going too slow for, for many of you. Um, if I'm going too slow, tell me. I, I can speed up. Just to see if I do this is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Don't okay. speed up. Speed up. Okay. This, this, is, this is new to me. This is great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any any question up to now? Okay. Um, okay. So when you look at so Coulomb gases or at many particle systems in general, there there have been essentially two two scales at which I can look. One is the 
in a macroscopic scale or the original scale. And in order to look at what happens at the macroscopic scale, we find the empirical measure. So you take the position of the particles, you can take their delta at all of them, you sum them, and you divide by n, and that gives you a probability measure. So that's a very natural object to look at. And the, the other scale that's natural to look at is a microscopic scale. Um, okay, so what's that? In that case, I take the position of the particles, I blow up by a factor of n to the one over d, or d is the measure. You might say, okay, what's what's so special about the factor of n to the one over d? Uh, what's special is that, uh, well, the, the like I said, the, the equilibrium measure typically has compact support. So generally, you're going to see n particles confined to a compact set in the dimension. That means that the distance between the particles is order n to the one over d. So if you zoom it by a factor of n to the one over d. You no longer observe a continuum, you start to see individual particles. And in that case, you don't normalize by anything, you don't divide by anything, because in that case, you already have uh, something which is finite on the compact sets. Uh, okay, so that's those are the, the two most natural scales to look at. The, the macroscopic scale, and you look at the empirical measure, and the microscopic scale, and you look at the empirical scale. Um, so the, this talk will be about what happens at a scale in between that. So that's what I call a mesoscopic scale. And in order to study that, we need to introduce a new observable, which is the local empirical field. Okay, so what's the logic behind this definition of the local empirical field? Uh, it's analogous to, to the previous one. You, you take the position of the particles, you blow up by a factor of n to the lambda. Now, lambda is between zero and one over d. So, I do blow up by some factor in the sense of infinity, but it's not by a factor so big that I start to observe individual points. So, I'm looking at, at, at a scale um, that tends to zero. But that it is still big enough that I don't see individual particles. I still see a continuum. Um, then I, I normalize by that power of n, one over n to the one minus lambda d. It's a relatively elementary computation. See that, that that's the right factor to get something that, that has finite mass on compact sets. Um, and for technical reasons, I have to restrict. To a, a compact set, which in this case is a box of, of size cells. So I cannot look at the behavior of that on the whole space. I can just look at the restriction of, of that to the compact uh, set, which for simplicity I choose to get. Um, okay, so, so this talk will, will be about this class, the local. Okay, um, any questions? Just want to make sure that I'm understanding. So these x sub i's that you just had in the last slide, these, these are all these are all the random variables for when you're treating it like a, when you're treating it as a gas and positive temperature. Yeah, um, yeah x i's are the, the positions of, of the particles. Uh, and that, well, I did say that, that I'm going to treat the positive temperature case, which means the random case, but these definitions don't really de depend on whether you're treating the zero temperature or positive temperature case. Uh, so I, I will use these definitions in the positive temperature case, but they still make sense in the zero temperature case. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is R going to be fixed? Yes, yeah. R, R, R is fixed. R. Lambda is fixed. Uh, D is fixed. Um, N goes to infinity, and I think that's that's it. Those are all the variables of this one. Okay. Um, okay, so now uh, I'll go to the rough uh, statements of the main results, and the main result is a larger D eight. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, I realize that there are people in this room who understand uh, larger deviation principles or LDPs better than I do, uh, but still uh, I will give it a basic in, in, intro to LDPs for the people. Who do. Uh, so uh, LDPs are a way of understanding uh, rare events in, in any random system. Uh, so if you think of pretty much any random system, there's the expected behavior, and then there are there are events. So, for example, in a coin, for flipping coins, um, if you flip n coins, then you know by law of large numbers that the typical event is that the ratio of heads to tails is one half. But now you can ask yourself, okay, what's the probability that that ratio is zero point seven or that ratio is zero point two? Of course, that ratio will that what well, the probability of observing that ratio will of course be small, uh, but how small? And uh, how much smaller is the probability of observing a ratio of 0 0.1 I and mean, not 0 0.4? So, so that, that's uh, more or less what LDPs are, <clears throat> are about. Um, okay, so when I say that, that uh, the push forward of P and beta, P and beta is a gauge measure by a local number of field that satisfies an LDP or grade function n on the speed a n. It roughly means that, that the probability that the local empirical field looks a lot like, uh, like a, a positive measure in mu is basically given by the exponential of minus a n, where a n is a sequence that, <clears throat> that tends to infinity, times uh, the functional f to mu. Uh, of course, the exact statement is a little more technical, but but roughly that that's that that's what an LVP means. It means that the order of magnitude of or the probability of observing a rare event is exponential of <clears throat> minus n, and the exact probability is given by the rate function at the point that you're looking at. And okay, if you're looking at this for the first time, like I did, uh, you can say, well, doesn't it depend on the size of epsilon or doesn't it depend on the topology that I chose? And no, it, it really doesn't. <clears throat> so so you, you really don't need to worry much about what topology you choose or what it should look like. Um, okay, so that's how you keep in general. For, <clears throat> For our case, well, uh, we, as, as I told you before, as long as the temperature is not too big, we know that the empirical measure will converge to the equilibrium measure. Uh, so th that means that if I zoom in and around the point, the, the typical event will be that, that the local empirical field is a uniform density and its, its weight is given by the, the, the equilibrium measure at zero. It's given by the equilibrium measure at zero because I chose to blow up around point zero. Uh, if I had chosen to blow up around any other point, it would be in the equilibrium measure around the point zero. Uh, okay, so that's the typical event for <clears throat> so the for expectation. It is the expectation, but it's more than that. Um, <clears throat> so, so the um, <clears throat> The, the event that that the local empirical field uh, looks basically like a uniform distribution with weight given by nu d of zero is it, it's not only the, the the expected behavior. It's 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 uh, an event that happens so frequently that it has an overwhelming probability. So that that the probability of observing anything else is tiny, but we still care about. The probability of observing those rare events. Okay. Uh, questions? Uh, okay. So again, uh, in my setting, I work in a case where beta is given by a, a power of n, and I need to restrict to a power 
uh, gamma in this range, B minus two over D and one. The reason for that, give the statement, prove it, is that, is that when the gamma is, is equal to one, the, the effect of the temperature is so big that you start to observe it at a macroscopic uh, level. So, so a starting point of this work is that at a microscopic level, the empirical measure converges to the equilibrium measure. And, and then we can ask, of, of, well, then we can ask the final questions. But for gamma bigger than one, or actually equal to one, the, the empirical measure no longer converges to, to the <clears throat> equilibrium measure because the effect of the temperature is so big that there are particles spreading out to infinity and so doesn't make sense to ask the final questions. Um, the other extreme is when gamma is equal to d minus two over d, and here what, what happens is is the opposite: is that the effect of the temperature is <clears throat> uh, so small that even on a microscopic uh, scale we observe uh, crystallization. Um, so we observe uh, particles that range around the the minimizer of what's called a <clears throat> um, uh, of the renormalized energy. So it's even conjectured that, that crystallization will occur uh, not for a value of gamma that's smaller than d minus two over d, but for a gamma that's some constant times uh, d minus two over d and the value of well, whether that, that actually happens is still being debated, and of course, the exact value of that constant is a very interesting thing. But that's that's it. that's about the crystallization conjecture. Um, that's that's really not what it's about. Okay, so what this will be about is um, if gamma. Okay, oh, and also there is a there is a critical uh, gamma. So that's gamma tau. So that's going to be a critical temperature issue. So the, the statement of the main result is that if gamma is smaller than gamma star, in other words, the, the temperature is smaller than, than a certain threshold, <clears throat> then uh, the, the effect of, of the energy will, will dominate, the effect of the entropy or temperature uh, will, be, uh, will be negligible. And so rare events will be dominate, will be, will be determined by a rate function that is derived from energy. Um, if gamma is bigger than, than gamma star, then the opposite will happen. The effect of, of temperature will, will, sorry, the effect of the Hamiltonian will be negligible, and the rare events will be determined by, by the entropy. And in the critical regime, then the effect of the electric energy and the entropy will compete. So this is a specific example of something that happens very generally in, in statistical mechanics. Because whenever you have a Gibbs measure, there are two competing forces. There's the Hamiltonian, which prefers particles to, to be arranged in the in the minimizer, and that's a source of order. And then, and then, <clears throat> then there's the effect of entropy, which prefers points uh, to be random, and that's a source of chaos. Okay, and I just realized I need to speed up because I have less time than that. Um, okay, so that's this is one example of <clears throat> that general principle of either energy or entropy uh, being dominant depending on the size of the temperature. Uh, okay, so now I'll give a, a brief intro on how one proves the LDPs uh, in general. So we have, an LDP is basically an, asymptot an asymptote for a probability. So in order to prove that asymptote on the probability, you generally prove an upper bound and a lower bound. And proving the, the upper bound is really very similar to to proving an, a, a lower bound for an energy functional. So that's 
very similar to Roland Kelp's variations. <coughs> and the lower band is usually done by exhibiting a construction. So that our family of configurations will check for lambda. And then the proof starts by saying the probability that the local empirical field is in <coughs> some in that polarized uh, mu is bigger than, than the probability of that specific family that, that I built. And then that, that's the first answer. Uh, so this is uh, pretty much like a gamma convergence to, uh, to that, that kind of thing. Uh, you can apply this to point flips, but I won't for like. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I will now uh, move to, to the upper bound of my LDP. And the, the upper bound starts first by bounding the the energy and the volume terms uh, separately. So you can <clears throat> you can start by uh, getting uh, this this inequality, and uh, this is basically amounts to bounding and an integral by its maximum value times its volume. So this term is its maximum value. This term is <clears throat> is, is the volume. Um, now you you notice I have a function here w of new, and that's a discrete analog of the, the function phi, which shows up in the other key. Um, okay, so now I've uh, split this integral into two two terms, and I can deal with each of them separately. Uh, so the first thing I do is that I recover the entropy derived. Uh, <clears throat> uh, rate function from the volume term, and it has weight uh, n to the to the <clears throat> one minus lambda d. Uh, so that that that's basically a consequence of the fact that I have n n to the one minus lambda d particles inside my box. So this is more or less like a Sanov's uh, theorem, where I have uh, n to the one minus, minus lambda d uh, particles. Um, so it's not exactly that because I still have to worry about the particles outside the box, but that's more or less the idea. And then on the other hand, I have the energy term. <clears throat> so I can also show that there is convergence <clears throat> um, of w to, uh, to phi. And now what's, what's important here is the weight that each of these two terms um, has. But um, the weight of the entropy term is n to the one minus lambda d. The weight of the energy term is beta times n to the two minus lambda times uh, d plus two. Um, and the, the, the reason for, for this scaling is actually <clears throat> somewhat elementary and, and it comes just from the scaling relation satisfied by, by the, the Coulomb current. But then from that, I can, <clears throat> I can get what the critical temperature scaling um, needs to be. It, we find that by whether the, the weight of the entropy term is smaller or bigger than the weight of the energy term. And so depending on whether on which one of those uh, happens, I can say that, that the, the entropy will be determined by the, the energy term with weight uh, beta into two minus lambda d plus two, or it will be uh, determined by the entropy term with weight n to the one minus lambda d. Uh, okay, so that's <clears throat> that's the upper bound. The, the lower bound, as I told you, will uh, consist in defining a family of configurations. And okay, that family of configurations starts by taking an arbitrary measure uh, nu on R, which is not necessarily a probability measure because it could have mass smaller or bigger than one, but it is certainly possible because there's no way of having a negative number of particles in a box. Uh, okay, so the family of configurations has to satisfy three things. One is that the associated empirical measure is close. The other is that the volume of their family of configurations is big enough. And the other is that the 
the electric interaction of tenant pair to measure with the measure new that, that I started with is small. I won't get into the details of what small now for big. Uh, okay, so that's <clears throat> that's a family of configurations. Now I have to show that they actually work. And then the way to show that, that they actually work is by computing the volume according to the Gibbs measure. And uh, <clears throat> computing the volume according to, to the Gibbs measure amounts to computing this, this new partition function. So it's a partition function in which the points inside the, the cube or the shrunk down cube are fixed and I integrate with respect to the particles that are outside of that cube. So uh, in order to complete the proof, I need to get asymptotics of that, of that configuration dependent partition function. And, but writing it as a partition function is very useful because there, there are variational characterizations of, of partition functions. So I can take that variational characterization. I can get asymptotes um, <clears throat> in the limit as n tends to infinity and show that, that I recover the energy derived uh, rate function in one case, or I recover the, the entropy based uh, rate function at least after integrating over the whole family in, in the other case. And I think I don't have any time to talk about the paper machine now. So, back I'm already over time in the next year. Yeah, we are a little bit over is it like 33 minutes so far. Okay, I thought, I thought it was worse. Uh, okay, but in any case, I don't think I have time to talk about the critical machine, so I'll stop here. So the the what was the question? The question was. Uh, where does the gamma star come from inside? What's so special about the critical temperature machine? So it's, it's here. Um, the, <clears throat> the thing about the gamma star is that I have in my upper bound for the probability, basically um, two terms, which are this, this energy term and this uh, volume term. So this, this energy term is the exponential of something with a weight beta times n to the two minus e plus two lambda. And this, this volume term, I mean, it's not obvious from the way it's written right now, but, but we can also show that asymptotically it's given by the exponential of something with weight n to the one minus lambda b. So if I have the product of an of two exponentials, and that each exponential is minus something with a certain order of magnitude, the, that will essentially be, be determined by the exponential of the minus something uh, which is bigger. So, I, I think it's just beta. It's just beta, so when there is equality in the two terms. Mm -hmm. Six uh, beta going by the power of n, and the power is beta. Yeah, the beta is given by the entropy minus gamma. So, so the, the critical temperature scaling regime is the one in which these two are the same. And of course, it depends on beta. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions? We can uh, ask more questions in the coffee break time because yes, dinner, dinner time. <laughs> But it was very tough to to fit it in a, in a <laughs> mini talk. It's always a, a complicated.